Hi, this is Brett Ingram, award-winning entrepreneur. And today, I want to share with you 10 secrets to persuasive marketing that converts prospects into customers. If we run any kind of business, it doesn't matter what entrepreneur we are or what business or what industry or no matter how it's set up, one of our core functions for any entrepreneur in any business is to get customers. It's to get our message in front of our prospects and find ways to convert them into customers. That is the very essence of building a business. So it's one of the most important things entrepreneurs can learn to do and also to optimize. To be able to do it is one thing, but also to be able to optimize it in a way where we can maximize the amount of new customers we can get for a minimum amount of effort or resources, the better. So let's talk about how to do exactly that. This is a skill that sort of everybody just takes off and starts to do because by definition you have to if you run a business. But there's actually more to it and if we really understand what goes into persuasive marketing, then we are far more equipped to be able to proactively and by design create a marketing campaigns that generate more leads, that generate more sales and convert more customers, as opposed to just hoping that the stuff that we're going to do converts. Persuasive marketing that effectively converts prospects into customers actually involves a combination of strategies and techniques. And it, it's focused on the understanding and influencing the behavior and decision-making processes of potential clients. So in, at its core, that's ultimately what we're doing. So I want to share some of the key secrets to how to do this and how to achieve this. The first step that we always have to embark on in anything when we're doing anything in business, and this should probably just be emblazoned somewhere in, in the, the books of any kind of business or whatever, is to understand our audience, right? Everything always starts with an understanding of our audience. If we don't know who we're trying to persuade, then how are we ever going to do it? If we don't know anything about them and we don't know what they want, what they don't want, what they care about, what they're afraid of, what their dreams and what their fears are, it's going to be really difficult to be able to craft something that makes sense. What ends up happening when we don't have a clear idea of our audience is we think about various ways and techniques that we can use maybe flowery language and stuff like that to try to convince people. But we can't write something that strikes at the core that really cuts through it all for them and grabs their attention like we can if we understand them. If we know what somebody's motivations and fears and dreams are, and we know what problems they have that they're trying to solve and what things would make their lives better or easier or whatever, it's far easier at that point to be able to craft something because we can speak directly to them. Even though we're marketing one to many and we're going after a whole audience, we don't speak to people in that way. We speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. So when the message that we have seems personal and it seems as though we understand what their problem is, then we're more likely to be able to do it. Someone who I highly respect, who's a master at this, is Jay Abraham. He's a marketing legend, older school. From He grew up during the era of big advertising and direct mail and all that other stuff. He obviously does digital marketing and things like that now. But the fact of the matter is, I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times. And I've gotten some of his resources and stuff. And the letters that he would send in the mail, you'd be shocked by how effective a letter of just type. No pictures, no images no like visual media, just type. But he, if he catches you with the headline and you start to read it, he was so good at understanding what who his audience was and what their pain points were that it just forced you to read it. And you would read the entire letter, like six pages of single space type. And he was a master at this. He took out full ads in newspapers that were single space type. And that's it, no pictures. And made records and sales doing it because it was about the message. It wasn't about the format. So we need to know who our potential customers are. 
what they need, what their problems are that they're trying to solve, and then we want to tailor our messages to address their specific needs and concerns. So we don't want to try the catch-all thing where we just throw the lure out into the water and hope somebody bites. We want to be far more targeted because also when we're able to do that, it lets us save a lot of money and time because we're marketing only to an audience that is potential prospects instead of wasting money on people that have no chance of ever buying. And we have a lot more ability to do various other things. I get um, on a fairly regular basis, and I don't really know why, I get letters in the mail that have a stamp on the outside that say something like, you qualify due to your veteran status. I'm not a military veteran. I never served in the military. I have no connection with the military whatsoever other than through my family. My, my father was in the uh, Coast Guard Academy and also in the Air Force. But, and I have other relatives, but I personally was never in the military. But I get these things all the time. And by the way, I don't have the same name as my dad, so they're not sending it thinking that it's him. But the fact of the matter is I get these and I shred them. They go right in the trash because I already don't qualify and they already don't know who I am. I don't have any connection with the military. That money to send me that envelope was a waste. However, I ended up on some list as an active veteran or whatever, it was a waste of money. And that's a perfect example. I've gotten other letters in the mail where it speaks to me directly. And so I'll open it and I'll read it. The second element of persuasive marketing is that we want to emphasize the value and benefits. One of the things, if we create a product or a service and we are the owner of it and it's our brainchild and everything else, we get so excited about the product that there's a lot of, of tendency to start preaching or selling or pushing features of a product. What well, is this feature and that button and this? And ultimately, all of those things, the features don't matter to customers. What matters to customers is value and benefits. How does that help them? Oh, it has an equalizer knob. Okay, great. You can adjust the sound to be just the way that you want it to sound. So if you like more bass or you like more treble or whatever, okay, that's a benefit, right? So we want to focus on the benefits. But it has ashwagandha and six other like herbal things. Nobody cares. It has things in it that will help you naturally burn fat and make your body into, a, into an organic furnace that will melt the fat off your body, great, that's a benefit. So if I buy this product, I will burn fat, right? Not, it's got all these ingredients in it because who cares about that? So we wanna emphasize the value and we wanna emphasize the benefits. What does the customer get? How does their life improve? How are their problems solved? By buying our product, availing our services, whatever it is. We wanna clearly communicate the value and the benefits of our product or service. And so if we have one main one, we always want to make sure that we get that front and center if there's one big one, but we also want to bring in all the other ones too because you never know what one will push somebody over the edge. But we want to focus how it can solve problems or improve a customer's life. So it's the end result, right, that we're thinking about rather than just listing the features. So the idea here is that imagine yourself in your bikini body 30 pounds lighter or at your goal weight, right, by summertime. Okay, wow, as opposed to selling the features of the product. So if you can get your prospect or customer to envision the end in mind, to envision having like received the benefit and being at, like at the point where they've already benefited from it, you're much better off and you will convert far more um, prospects into customers by doing that. We want to create compelling content, even if it's ads, right? It needs to be compelling. This doesn't necessarily need to be content as in content marketing. It can be advertisements, promotions, whatever. But we want it to be compelling. We want to use engaging and relevant content to attract and retain our audience and get their attention. Look, attention is really hard to get nowadays, and it's even harder to keep. So whether we're using a blog or videos or infographics or ads or social media or direct mail or TV or radio or a podcast, we want to do things that educate, entertain, inform, right, whatever, and at the same time speak to the benefits. So the fact of the matter is if we can make what we're doing entertaining or valuable, 
in addition to just informative, that's always going to play a far better, right? That's always going to be something that's going to give us more traction. We want to leverage social proof. This is a very important element, particularly in the digital marketing space. Social proof is simply letting other people talk about the benefits they got from our products instead of us telling people about what the benefits are. Of course, we're going to say our product is the best thing. It's our product. Of course, we're going to talk about the benefits, and there's value in that. But when we can get other people who have used our product already share their story and share the results that they got, that carries far more weight because people understand that if somebody else is saying it and they aren't incentivized and they aren't on the board of directors or they aren't a partner in the business or they aren't getting a commission, it's far more powerful than it is if they're being compensated or if they get have something to gain. And we, again, we see this in our everyday lives. When we have a friend who tells us that this movie is great, we want to go see it. When we see the ad telling us how great it is, eh, we know that's marketing. We know that the people that put that together made that so we would want to go see it because they're going to make money, right? So everybody knows that. We, we live in a cynical world. And the fact of the matter is, it's something like 86% of people now will look up reviews for products before they buy them if they exist online. And so particularly the online market space where people can't come in and touch and see and feel and smell your product, right? We want to be able to give social proof. We want to show other customers getting benefits in their own words. If they can do video social proof, that's awesome. Images with their signatures, awesome. Even if we have to tell the story on their behalf, if they, we get permission to use it, great. But we want to have social proof as often as possible. And every time there's a point of purchase or a call to action, we want to have social proof there. People often will look to others before they make a decision. So testimonials, reviews, case studies, endorsements, all of those things build trust and credibility. They lower the barriers to get people to buy and they increase conversions. And it's documented, documented that it works over and over again. We want to use emotional appeals. This is something that's aligned to the benefits features thing. I'm a very analytical person. So in general, I like bullets. I like to see all the stuff that the product can do. I like to see what's in it, all these other kinds of things, right? I do actually read ingredient labels <laughs> on supplements and energy drinks and stuff like that. So that's fine. But people don't make purchase decisions based on that. They make purchase decisions based on emotional appeal. And then they justify with logic. So the idea is you can do both. You can list everything out and you can give all the detail and all the frequently asked questions and all this other stuff. But the way you hook people initially and the way you get them to make the purchase is by tapping into their emotions rather than their logic. And so the greatest way to tap into emotions are to help them envision having already achieved the result you're in your bikini body by summer, boom, that's emotional, it's visceral. If I can imagine that and I'm, a, you know, and I'm a woman and I want to be on the beach, but I'm a little embarrassed or I feel like I'm a little bit overweight or whatever, and you're telling me that I'm going to be able to get into my bikini and get on the beach and be proud of how I look and do that in a couple of months, that gives me an emotional response. It's more than just logic. It's more than just thinking analytically, oh yeah, that would be neat. I feel good because I can picture myself standing proud and walking along the beach and feeling good about myself, right? So that is really the key when we're doing this kind of stuff. We want to use storytelling and emotional triggers to connect with our audience on a personal level. That stuff is very important. Another element of this is to offer a clear call to action or a CTA, right? So this is something that's funny because a lot of people take this for granted. They feel as though if I have a product and it's up there, of course people are going to buy it, right? I, I, I put the product up there on the page. Everybody knows what I'm selling. Why wouldn't they just go and buy it? I made all. It's amazing the difference it makes. This has been studied and they've done you know tests on this with and without call to action. And when you use a call to action where you tell people, click the button below, fill out the form on the checkout page to get started now, it actually makes a quantifiable difference. And to repeat it over and over again is even more effective. 
So even though it seems logical, even though it seems unnecessary, it's vitally important to make it clear what you want our prospects to do next. So whether it's make a purchase, sign up for a newsletter, contact our sales team, whatever it is, the call to action should be clear, compelling, and repeated over and over again. Another key element of this is to create a sense of urgency. We want to have a limited time offer, some sort of exclusivity, some sort of deal, right? The fear of missing out is very powerful and motivates people to act quickly. When we do product launches, the initial day is usually the biggest day because it's brand new to the market. Everyone's promoting it. Everyone's excited. No one's seen the product before, no doubt. Then it trails off. You know what the second biggest day of a product launch is? The closing day. Because as soon as you start to tell people this offer is going to be gone forever, now is your last chance, all of a sudden it spikes up again because people don't want to miss out if it's something they're interested in. And the funny part about this is sometimes the closing day can do as much as the opening launch day or sometimes even more. But oftentimes it does the second biggest day, you know, following the launch day. Scarcity and urgency is super, super important. And then we want to optimize for conversions. If we're doing everything and we've got it all right, that's great. But then the key is to use A-B testing so we're split testing various different ideas and use analytics so we can understand what's working best for converting our leads into customers and do more of that and lean into that. We can continuously refine and optimize our marketing strategies based on the data and the feedback. This is a vitally important element because first of all, we don't live in a vacuum. So things are always changing. Even if you run ad campaigns and they work today, I know Facebook and the online ads are famous for this. You'll have an ad that works like gangbusters and it will work and work and then all of a sudden it starts to lose its effectiveness. Enough people have seen it, it starts to dry up and you've got to change it around. So we can't just get something that's working and sit back and say, okay, that's good enough. First of all, if we don't optimize, we don't know what our ceiling is. But second of all, we're going to be caught with our pants down if it all of a sudden stops working. So we always want to be testing and have that built into our loop. We're always testing against the control, against the best performing ad or marketing thing, testing something else against it so we can always see what's working and we can move closer and closer toward making more campaigns that work and fewer that don't. All of those things are super important. Another element of effective persuasive marketing is follow-up. They say it takes an average of seven contacts to convert a prospect to a customer. And if we reach out to people once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, we may lose that sale that have we just reached out one more time, we get them. I was in staffing for years, and this was a very famous thing we used to always do. You cold call clients over and over, sometimes weeks, sometimes for months. You leave them voicemails, can never get them live on the phone. Every time you do get them, they're not interested, they're busy, whatever. Then all of a sudden, one time you hit them and they have three jobs for you to fill. Because it's all about timing. Sometimes it's not that your product or service is wrong, it's that the timing is wrong. Sometimes it's that they don't trust you. Sometimes it's that they don't have a big enough need. They don't have a budget to be able to buy it. As time goes, things change for people. Now all of a sudden they're more motivated for this and now they want it. So sometimes prospects need a gentle nudge to make a decision. So if we do follow-up emails, retargeting ads, direct contact, it can help us convert leads who didn't initially make a purchase. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do with all of this is to build relationships, right? When we build relationships, we have long-term customer relationships are the key to sustainable business success. We want customers that come back to us over and over again so we aren't always trying to get new customers. They are the cheapest and the most profitable because they already believe in our products and services. So if we provide excellent customer service, we collect feedback from our customers, fix what's broken, optimize everything so everyone's super happy, and engage with our customers regularly, we will build loyalty and encourage repeat business. People love to see that we're listening to them and they'll come back and back if they know that we're going to take their advice. And ultimately, the reason we want to do all that stuff is to build relationships. Because long-term customer relationships are the key to sustainable business success. If we provide excellent customer service, we seek feedback, and engage with our customers regularly, 
will be able to build loyalty and encourage repeat business. And that is really the key. Once we've got the persuasive marketing going, we want to make sure we're nurturing that and we're really building our customer base and our evangelists out there so we continue to grow and continue to gain new customers from our own efforts and theirs as well. By combining these strategies with a deep understanding of the target audience and continuous optimization based on performance data, we can develop persuasive marketing campaigns that effectively convert prospects into customers. So the takeaway here is that no matter how great our products, services, mission, or vision are, to be successful, we have to be able to convince our prospects to buy in order to make it all work. Sales generate revenue, which we need to stay in business for one, and for another to scale and grow and expand. So the better we get at this skill, the more sales we can make, the faster we can grow, and the greater the likelihood that we succeed. <music>